thank you all for coming here. I, I expected to see an empty hall. <laughs> and it's, it's really, it's been a terrific day for rain, which is good. But I really, I didn't know, in fact, I rang up Dipti and asked her, should we be having this program today or what do you, what do you guys think? Anyway, we're here. Thank you for coming. Getting into this issue of governance by gagging. Um, I think all of us here are pretty, are justifiably and legitimately shocked at the digging out of, from the mothballs of a 14 year old speech and the sanction for prosecution under UAPA for Sheikh Shaukat Ali and uh, Aruna Roy, Arundhati Roy, sorry, Arundhati Roy, and yet, while it's shocking, it shouldn't be surprising. You know? We live in an era where the Delhi High Court has found that the, we, we live in a era where the Delhi High Court has found that the words Inkilab Zindabad, Krantikari Salam are uh, the, the exact incriminating, inflammatory and anti-national. Inkilab Zindabad, Krantikari Salam, these are inc incriminatory and inflammatory and even perhaps anti-national. This was while delivering, while uh, denying Umar Khalid bail in the UAPA case against him. The learned judges discussed at length, I'm quoting, certain phraseology. Oh, in fact, let me show you the phraseology. Um, the certain... Thanks for that, yeah. Certain phraseology in the speech of the appellant, which prima facie appeared to be incriminating per se and inflammatory. The court holds that the Delhi police's charge of terrorism against Umar Khalid are prima facie true. A prima facie true, making him ineligible for bail. So, folks, a speech with inkilabi salam is now enough to land you in the choki hmm? for threatening the unity, integrity, and security of the nation. If you make a speech starting with inkilabi salam or krantikari salam. Actually, uh, that's, that's not just where it ends. It's not just at the thing. I'm looking at case, cases, case papers, and judgments from the Supreme Court, which say, uh, which say, oh, lower down, you can read the rest of it if you like. You want to, you want to cut out the thing? Yeah, that's fine. You want to go into slideshow mode? Okay, fine. Yeah. Actually, if you look, many of the uh, judgment papers coming out of the Supreme Court are saying so and so, in the case of so and so versus Union of Bharat. So maybe some smart defense lawyer will pick up on this and use it in the next case saying that my client's rants were directed, directed at the now defunct entity called India and, were, and, and had nothing to do with our real nation, which is Bharat. Right? So, I mean, that's, that's where it seems to be getting to now. <coughs> the other thing is, the other interesting thing about the day we are meeting, apart from the downpour, is that it's about three days, 72 hours, from India's favorite political anniversary, 
June 25, 1975, declaration of the emergency. <clears throat> and it's a good thing you to, to have to remember that, to memorialize that. Last year I did the Father Stan Swami memorial lecture on that in Ranchi, which lecture just disappeared off the internet a few days later. Um, but what's, what's important for us to remember now is that June 25th, that one day, that one day every year, we ritualize our remembrance of the emergency. While every day, every year, we institutionalize our embrace of it. Yeah? Every day, every year, you have something, some judicial order, some law, some bylaw, state law, municipal laws, you know, which, which institutionalize our embrace of that emergency. Too many of Professor Amartya Sen's argumentative Indians have been largely gagged this past decade. For that matter, Professor Sen himself, consider, has been a target of the gagging process. Yeah? Where he's been threatened that his, his boundary walls of his house will be torn down by bulldozers yeah, by the then Vice Chancellor who has mercifully retired of the Vishwa Bharati, that Professor Sen and a 19 cents of land would be grabbed by the university, claiming it as its own. So what do we mean by what do we mean by governance by gagging? There's many, many ways governance no longer just means governments. There are other actors involved. And gagging is of many kinds. I'll look at four or five um, I'll look at four or five forms of major forms of gagging. There are many more, but these maybe I'm competent to look at. And uh, this morning when I, I gave this topic to Dipti and then this morning when I looked at and I realized that it's huge and I'm never going to be able to do this in an hour. Each of the five forms of gagging can take a lecture by itself. So I begin with this disclaimer. You know, I'm not going to be able to do everything. I begin with this disclaimer that uh, I am, unlike the Vishwa Guru, I am biologically born. <laughs> yeah, and of the humble of the humble Homo sapiens species. And I have no divine origin or mandate. So I have, there are physical limits to what I can deliver in this hour for you. I'll try my best. Um, you know, I've, I've got tired of people telling me that the job of the journalist is to speak the truth to power. It's a nice cliche. I don't mind it actually in itself. But it seems to be that people, you know, you know this talk, truth to power somehow seems to imply that power is somehow so naive and innocent. You see, they're there waiting to be corrected by us and we tell them the truth and they will set it right. Power knows a hell of a lot more about what's going on than you and I and all the journalists put together. The idea that, you know, talk the truth to them and you will change the world, that's rubbish. My thing is talk the truth, period, okay? I mean, why only to them? Hmm. But I think there's a far more important thing. I think you need to go far beyond talking the truth to power. We need to talk the truth. The journalists need to talk the truth about power. We need to coalition, A, of socio-religious fundamentalists, B, of economic market fundamentalists, and C, the bed cohabited by this happy union is what some are pleased to call mainstream media, what I call corporate media, because that's who owns the media, that's who controls the media, that's who has the media in an iron grasp and what you are allowed to see and know and not know. You got a very good example of that kind of control in the coverage of these elections, not just the exit polls but the TV and everything. The only real journalism you got came from individual YouTuber channels in the Hindi belt. Yeah? And individual uh, uh, 
individual alternative journals and magazines and newspapers, but not from the corporate media. Because they cannot. They are part of this alliance. They are part, and they are a very important part of this alliance. Now there is a heavy overlap and overlay between these three categories, socio-religious fundamentalists, economic fundamental, market fundamentalists, and corporate media. Many in power are both religious and market fundamentalists. They're both. Many corporate persons also are both fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists, and economic market fundamentalists. Uh, and corporate media, you know, I tried this morning making a count of how many media proprietors there are who do not have their personalized Godman, Sadhu, Sadhvi. It's very difficult. You can count them on the fingers of one hand and have three fingers left over. Yeah. So these are the three forces. When we talk about corporate dominance, I'm speaking about a very increasingly narrow layer of corporates. Not the entire corporate sector, but the power that is happening an ever-expanding power in an ever-narrowing strata. More and more concentration of wealth and power in extreme, in, in a diminishing number of hands. Call it a corporate uh, super elite, or if you will, a corporate, as I do, a corporate kleptocracy. Uh, now, what are these five forms of gagging that I'm going to try and race through? One is gagging by laws. I'll just list out the five and then we'll go one by one. Spoiler is that number four is the main thing. But anyway, gagging by laws, um, which governments have been doing for a very long I also have to say that most of these laws and things that I'm speaking about, most of the problems that I'm speaking about, None of them started in 2014. And we should absorb this fact and be honest about it because otherwise we are just shaping something to suit a political narrative. But something does happen in 2014. Okay? Gagging by laws, which governments do, all that governments require to be able to gag you through laws is the selective silence or indifference of the judiciary. Unfortunately, they're not just getting selective silence or indifference, they're getting active endorsement from the judiciary. That is one huge problem in the gagging that takes place through laws. Second, by gagging by extra-legal or plainly illegal means, by violence of non-state actors with a connivance often of the state, like you saw in Manipur. Hmm? Or you see the silence in terms of mob lynchings. Whatever happened to all those who were there who lynched Aflaq Khan? Nothing. Nothing happened to them. What's happened to those in Hatras? The lynchings continue and are scary in their regularity. Mob lynchings. The third, uh, I, but I also believe that this silence or this connivance it's only possible by, me, by the medias. And whenever I say media, today I mean corporate media, dominant media. Only by, it's possible by the corporate media's connivance and collusion, which bring us to gagging number three, corporate media and big money, which among many other things, corporates, by the way, gag their own journalists. The media gags its own journalists through retrenchment, transfers. By the, I was on a subcommittee of the Press Council of India looking at the retrenchments and layoffs during the pandemic. When we wrote letters to the... We'll, we'll, get, we'll get there soon. Uh, but building a corporate universe where none of you even knows about the layoffs. How many of you know that 3,500 journalists lost their jobs in the first 16 months of the pandemic? after being marked as an essential service. You're not supposed, the whole point of essential service is that your job is bloody protected. Okay? And 
3,000 to 3,500 at the May 22 affidavit of the Delhi Union of Journalists, which tells the court, Supreme Court, this is a very partial number. We don't have all the data because the day of the journalist unions is gone. We are not even able to put together all the data that we require to know how many. And apart, that's only 3,000, 3,500 journalists. Apart from that, 10 to 15,000 non-journalist media workers. Yeah? That's another thing. Um, and you, you can see how all this reflects. The, the people, you know, they, you, you, you curb the journalists through retrenchments, transfers, pay cuts and more. Building a, uh, building a censorship universe that few outside of media are aware of and that few inside the media will dare speak of. Four, big money and inequality. Uh, big, big money and inequality. Inequality in India, if you've seen what Thomas Piketty, the inequality labs, etc., several others have said, is today at levels rivaling and even exceeding the inequalities that you saw in the heyday of British imperialism and the British Raj in the 1920s. Okay? It's an astonishing feat for a country whose freedom struggle was based on fighting inequality, whose entire raison d'etre, whose entire soul was around fighting inequality. That was your freedom struggle. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, just one little thing and we come to each of these Forbes tells me my favorite website Forbes it's you know our growing numbers of billionaires I think it's the website I most regularly look at it's a very aspirational thing maybe one day you know? <laughs> so uh, Forbes tells me that we now have 200 dollar billionaires in a country which had zero between in 1991 when we started our new economic path and even as late as 1995 we had zero dollar billionaires we have 200 now <laughs> these 200 their collective net worth is 974 billion dollars that is 200 individuals by the way on your population of 1.41 billion is zero point 0.000014% of your population and this you know negligible percentage figure these 200 hold wealth equivalent to 25% of your gross domestic product reminding you of that whole other meaning of gross and it's not surprising then that the media covered the farm laws and the farmer struggle the way they did entirely on the side of the corporate world and the government. It's not surprising. That, anyway, nothing is surprising anymore. It just continues to get more shocking. All these above four gaggings, these factors lead to the number five. Also a very important one. Thank heavens for the Indian ordinary people who struck a blow against it this June 4, which is self-censorship. Okay? Now, this self-censorship happens. We all keep quiet about a lot of things, much more than we should ever. Sometimes it happens in self-interest and for personal gain. More often it happens from fear and intimidation. And very likely from apprehension of the risk of losing your job or being thrown in jail. These are the major things that drive it, but we'll, we'll get into a little more about this later. Of these different uh, forms of gagging, uh, you know, the, the entire plethora, on the one hand, old laws are being brought out of the Archives and being used with a vengeance, yeah, like Epidemic and Diseases Act and Old Telegraph Act, which has now become the Telecommunications Act of 2023. Yeah, but then there are 
old laws which are being used in the form they were there are old laws being used anew with amendments like uapa is a 1967 law but the 2019 amendment makes it deadly okay uh um, then there are new laws and new laws which are amended within 2 years or 3 years of being made to make them more stringent and nastier and it leads to a plethora of contradictions confusions now if the delhi high court says um to the if the delhi high court says inkilab zindabad and uh, krantikari salam and all these are inflammatory incendiary whatever they say how do we explain the fact that the government of india's website oops yeah that the government of india's website on azadi ka amrut mahotsav why am i not okay azadi ka amrut mahotsav begins by glorifying inkilab zindabad in the page it has on hasrat mohani who coined the phrase or made it popular first yeah it was a muslim who did that he happened to do be a member of the communist party uh has inkilab zindabad the slogan which tore through the heart of the british empire was coined by uh, the maulana much who loved his krishna etc i guess that's why they put him up here but but he did he did first make inkilab zindabad a a very famous phrase thanks now what is the delhi high court going to do about these people this is a government of india website yeah glorifying inkilab zindabad by the way that's hasrat mohani who even exists on a postage stamp in your country for and famous for that one phrase inkilab zindabad yeah so the uh, if we look at the inequality uh, as i said and the, so number 4 the the um and five as i said was the gagging by self censorship but now let's look at the inequality stuff here we are with cumulative wealth of india's 200 dollar billionaires as i said is 974 billion usd the indian budget expenditure total expenditure was last year was 45 lakh or 562 billion which means that their wealth is 1.7 times greater than your total budget expenditure for the purists and others as my friend ramakumar warned me i better put in a little line showing them that what the pp uh, what the purchasing power parity adjusted dollars are so that you can have fun with your own calculations i've simply no time for it but i've given you the numbers mm. the cumulative wealth of these guys is 62 times the size of india's agricultural budget yeah which is 1.25 lakh crores or 15.62 billion dollars your ppp figure is there india's estimated budget i've given you that number mr ambani who graces the the totem pole of india's billionaires at the top his net worth is 118 billion us dollars as of last seen seven and a half times the expenditure of agriculture as stated in budget but would have been the biggest or second biggest beneficiary of the three farm laws okay so that is his claim to fame right now apart from apart from the pre wedding of his son which has spent a couple of 200 million dollars almost and got themselves turned down at a geneva restaurant for the noise they made on the lake geneva hmm? uh the the and you, how many of your newspapers and television channels have covered that yeah the owner of that refused to serve them lobster sandwiches he said there is no way to behave the way they asked and the way they came to him etc now you know the thing about the promise of capitalism though you know, is that if you and i work hard we can also be ambani we can also be adani now i have a problem with that let me put it this way if working hard 
made you a billionaire i think every woman in rural india should be a billionaire yeah and every woman in rural asia africa and latin america as well if hard work made you a billionaire but i decided let me be open minded about it let me be open minded about it and look at can a common man more likely a common woman make as much money as ambani's 118 billion dollars to my pleasant surprise i found it's possible it just takes a little time uh something like uh, three, it takes 340.6 million years uh for an household surviving on nrega the average wage on nrega is 289 rupees and on 100 days that's 28000 900 because that's 100 days of work you get 28900 rupees and to pile up the 118 billion it takes 340.6 million years now if that rural family were to be a little more modest in their aspirations and say look all we want to do is to earn what amba totally collect what mr ambani earns in one year, one year that would bring it down to a mere 5190 years um the uh, mr rambani by the way in 2019 modestly capped his salary at 15 crores annually and said it should not be more than that yeah other indian riches we are reading about in foreign papers though it burst its way into the times of india is the hindujas who have now been sentenced to four and a half years in prison for exploiting labor and for their exploiting their servants brought of course from india it's astonishing that times of india covered it but it tells me that probably that i i haven't seen much hinduja company advertising in the times of india recently so this tells me that we might see some advertising by the hindujas in the uh, in the times of india in coming days now in gagging by laws hmm, there does this as i said it only requires the silence and indifference of the judiciary the big phenomenon in gagging by laws a third of this country knew it long before we had the fire reached the urban middle classes in 2014 15 in the countryside the single biggest element the single biggest element of this gagging by laws is the criminalization of dissent okay the criminalization of dissent in fact when you look at who is at the receiving end you realize it's also a criminalization of poverty of being poor that's what it's about hmm. the big this uh, long before 2014 if this was happening in the country on quite a large scale in the countryside by the way dalits and adivasis are old hands at uh, criminalization of dissent sorry they they are very old hands at criminalization of dissent they know what it is they have experienced it grotesquely especially in the grabbing of the little land they have uh, it's after 2014 the fires reach the middle classes and the elite the urban middle classes in the elite now just give me uh, post 1914 post 2014 what happens the post 1991 i'm sorry i said long before 2014 post 1991 the land grab go up in scale and in laws in terms of forcibly acquiring land for scz's for various other projects of the elite and the corporate world and the ruling classes um just give you a few examples how you paralyze people and ordinary people take the posco agitation the agitation against posco where the people of jagat singhpur actually threw out posco to find themselves saddled with jindal but when they threw out posco the process that happened so hundreds and hundreds of cases being filed 
At one stage when I used to visit Jagat Singhpur, no 14-year-old kid could venture out of his village because there would be some case against him somewhere in some police station which he'd be picked up. Many families could not go for the wedding of their relations in another village because all of them had cases pending on their heads. Abai Sahu, the leader of that agitation, I checked with him this morning. You know, it's sad that one speaks to an old friend only to say, okay, how many cases today? And he clarified that 78 cases had been filed against him, 72, of which 58 are still pending. Yeah, they have not been withdrawn, they have not been dropped. If you went to Jagat Singhpur, all those people fighting for their rights, they were either Dalits or Adivasis. You know, the ones who were being jailed, okay. Then if you went to Srikakulam, as I did many years ago, a 78-year-old lady, this much, she couldn't be more than 35, 40 kilograms. I doubt if she was more than 35. Can hardly lift a sickle anymore. She was an agricultural laborer. Multiple cases including attempt to murder of police party. Armed police party. She is 78 years old. Yeah. And attempt to murder. Then in Kalinga Nagar, uh, there was this Adivasi couple, Ravi Jarika and I think Uma Jarika. Very educated, degrees, BSc degrees from Utkal University. Very unfamiliar with police stations and things. But once they stood up to the Tata steel plant and the firing happened, every, nobody there has less than 40 cases on their heads, continuing from 2005 onwards. Um, where, then there is Koraput, where I went and met, all pre-2014, where I went and met and tried to meet, because we could only meet as lawyer, finally, they'd, a young assistant professor of chemistry in a college in the Koraput jail. I went to meet him because the list of charges were fascinating. They included theft of a buffalo. So I went to Odisha's top cop, now retired, and asked him, what is this kind of crazy thing? In Ravi Jarika, you have some absurd bootlegging stuff, which is absolutely untrue. Here you have uh, uh, theft of a buffalo. He said so he was very forthcoming, maybe because he was a few days away from retirement. He was very forthcoming. He said, sir, you don't understand. When we take these cases to the court, the serious charges, the judges dismiss them. So, and I'm quoting him verbatim. He said, we need a judicious mix of charges. To keep that fellow under control in discipline, he has to report to the police station or at the court. That's all they do all their lives. Every week, four days, they're reporting at one police station or at a court or somewhere else. Yeah? A judicious mix of charges, including theft of a buffalo. And that young assistant professor probably would be able to tell the difference between buffalo and another bovine species with some difficulty, but otherwise has nothing to do with it. The cake prize goes to Kudankulam, the anti, where the, where the people fighting were mainly, mainly, uh, uh, you know, fishing communities, fisher folk. I checked this morning with them about what happened. Kudankulam is a fantastic case where the use of sedition, waging war against the state, it's unrivaled in any other part of the country. In uh, 1857, what we now call first war of our independence, though it wasn't, there were many earlier struggles for freedom. But between 1857 and 1947, the total number of people the British Raj prosecuted for sedition in Tamil Nadu was 2,000. In two years, 2011 to 2013, the number of people prosecuted for sedition in Kudankulam was 9,000. And the number of people pro charged with waging war on the state, 13,000. 13,000. 9,000 sedition. Okay? The entire British Raj period, 1857 to 1947, those 90 years, 2,000. 
from when the law and tradition began to be used in Tamil Nadu, I suspect. Uh, but something does happen in 2014. One, new laws, but more importantly, the scale, scope, and interpretative insanity of all the laws we have and some which we made post-2014, that explodes with 2014. And you're today sitting in a state where, in a nation, where the Delhi High Court says, Inkilab Zindabad is inflammatory and incriminatory. Yeah? So that's what happens, that scale on which it explodes from 2014, that's simply fantastic. Actually, when I went, after, when the JNU think trouble broke out, Kanaya's arrest, I went there, I did a teaching. My first comment to my descendants, if you like, because I'm a JNUite, 7780, the first thing I told the JNU students was, welcome to the rest of the country. <laughs> because all, and I told them about Kodakulam, I told them about Odisha, about Koraput and all of that. Now, new, many laws have had, many of the old laws had ridiculous clauses perched within their frame from colonial times. Suddenly these are applied with great energy. Those clauses were there before. Okay? But incredibly new energy in pushing them, they may not have been implemented in the last 75 years. And also brought in new laws that gain, that or new clauses that bring in a deadly new context. For sedition, for instance, and now, how many days away? Are we three days away from the new criminal courts? Oh boy, just look at, you know, when the law commission is asked to look at this law of sedition and throw it out, they, they, they suggest more stringency to the law. This is what your law commission did. They suggested there should be greater stringency to the sedition law. Now, just take, I'm going to run through some of these because I need to look at three more. They've done inequality and we're doing this loss thing. The Telegraph Act of uh, sedition we have done. The Telegraph Act now replaced with the Telecommunications Act of 2023. The Epidemic and Diseases Act 1897. Do you know that during the COVID, Journalists were arrested or char and charged under the Epidemic and Diseases Act, um, Act 1897. Samuel, Samuel Raja Pandian, uh, the guy who runs an, a portal in Coimbatore with a very beautiful name. It's a city magazine. It's called Simply City. Simply City. He was arrested for doing a story on the Coimbatore General Hospital doctors and nurses working without protective equipment. Okay? And then, obviously that story came from the doctors and nurses. But he was put under this, they were trying to book him under sedition, and uh, so you have that. Here's the thing, you, do you know who the last journalist was prosecuted under Epidemic and Diseases Act? He was from Maharashtra. His name was Bal Gangadhar Tilak. He was, he was prosecuted under the Epidemics and Diseases Act for writing and attacking the authorities on what was happening in the famine. Okay? So that, that is, that's where the la act was last used against a journalist. So there are, law, there are also laws that were brought in good faith which are implemented in bad faith. There are laws brought in bad faith which are implemented in worse faith. Uh, there are across the states, if you look at the laws at state level, the special project vehicles that allow states to do, those states that have this special, pro, special purpose vehicles, to grab any land they want from anyone and which also give also new powers brought by the states, like for instance Andhra and Telangana, a district collector can dismiss an elected sarpanch. A district collector can dismiss an elected sarpanch. You know, I'm, I'm saying the verdict people gave you on June 14 reflects that they know what's going on, that they know what's happening to democracy. And in those places you saw it. 
the prevention then there is the prevention of damage to property public property act most of the in almost all the delhi riots cases this has been brought in and the wonderful thing is that these people who are supposed to be de destroying public property this was happening at the same time when the government of india and security forces were building giant digging giant trenches in the national highway to stop the farmers at the gates of delhi nobody has brought any charges of destruction of public property against them for destroying the national highway that brings people to delhi yeah. um and uh, it's been it's been used by the and it doesn't at all refer to the demolition of hundreds of houses in uh, in different towns of up including ayodhya it doesn't look at what this demolition of the a horrible term and i appeal to you not to use it people keep talking about bulldozer justice it is bulldozer terror and that's what it should be called don't call it bulldozer don't dignify it by linking it with a word like justice which is to my mind the most important of all words uh the supreme court has upheld pmla the amended pmla and the P amended pmla one of the biggest targets is us journalists are being targeted under this if you prosecute a journalist under something you you should not allow him the chance to speak of freedom of expression if you say he is money laundering then people will think hey you know we shouldn't be speaking up in favor of this guy so this has been happening very frequently to journalists uh there are the fera the fema there's harsh mandar prosecuted under fera it's been used against activists a hell of a lot supremely important is the it act of 2000 or but just before i get to that the states have look at how the states have been using esma to criminalize strikes you're criminalizing strikes the right to strike is a fundamental right of the worker and anyway there is also crpc 144 which allows the government i mean it allows the state to do anything the damn state wants so you have that but as i said the it act of 2000 take down notices arrests of journalists arrests of activists arrests of anyone you don't like and the perpetual endless amendments to these laws very often here is the trick the laws themselves are very limited in scope but the rules uh, but the rules devised for the laws are unlimited and unending and keep you keep adding new rules to the rules under the law um the telecom act of 2023 it's under these that the government and previously telegraph act it's under these that the vishwa guru made us number 1 in one more field largest number of internet shutdowns and takedowns in the world no other nation comes close between 2012 and 2024 india saw more than 805 internet shutdowns two thirds of them in kashmir alone more than two thirds of them in just kashmir imagine what it is to live in that situation work in that situation then there are the state level acts the municipality rules laws on conversions you know state level law cow slaughter laws which the karnataka cow slaughter act takes an old phrase from old laws of the and has a gives it a totally new twist so you can be a vigilante go about destroying whatever you do and the law says those acting in good faith under this law may be deemed to be public servants so we go raid aflaq's house kill his family lynch the family lynch aflaq and i can be deemed a public servant this is the karnataka law it first brought as an ordinance and they haven't changed it in the final law um <coughs> there and then in all this the role of the judiciary they have upheld the criminal defamation act i mean they have upheld criminal defamation they have upheld the pmla money laundering amendments they wall they waffled a lot on sedition before it became irrelevant since it's all gone into your new codes and everything that will come 
they took forever to say that electoral bonds are un- you know not constitutional but they haven't directed a return of the money they haven't di- directed any return of the money so that money 85% of which was just with the bharatiya janata party does not have to be returned to anybody it's there they can spend it including in the forthcoming maharashtra elections and but the same supreme court it did not find time to r- r- rule on constitutionality of the farm laws the government repealed it before it came to that it takes years on all these to talk about constitutionality which is the job of the apex court yeah but it found time to initiate contempt proceedings against kunal kamra you know some of these stand up comics are very dangerous people terrible you got to you you have to know how to deal with them um, then there is number 4 the yet another gagging gagging by extra legal or illegal means where non state actors are not only tolerated but egged on by it you've had for 20 years the vhp and various temple related violence you've had bajrang dal and love jihad hmm. you've had um, cow slaughter lynchings and i just mentioned karnataka so what's happening is that laws that were in the, like in the karnataka law what was meant to protect public servants has been extended to private parties that is a deadly thing you are outsourcing violence to vigilantes the state's power to vigilantes now whether it was manipur or in other form, in other spheres attacks on bollywood or attacks on individuals um and attacks an institutional capture the banning of history books the bringing of new history books by the way full disclosure my work was also thrown out by the ncert uh but i was in distinguished company i got kicked out in the same batch as charles darwin <laughs> yeah um and which which reminds me of our old mumbai police commissioner uh, uh sing uh, sing uh, satyapal singh whom i used to know when he was actually police commissioner pune before police commissioner mumbai satyapal singh in the 2019 elections he made it his mission to destroy charles darwin he said it's the most unscientific thing who have you he asked all of us in his meeting in lucknow has any one of you i challenge has any one of you gone into the forest and watched apes turning into men where is your scientific proof i spoke in the same platform the very next day after he spoke and people raised this question and i said look he's got a point <laughs> hmm. none of us have ever seen apes turning into men but we are privileged people we live in an era where we are watching the reverse process <laughs> yeah and quite on a large scale so maybe he has a point let's not quarrel with him and worst of all in this extra legal violence is the murder of four leading public intellectuals in the last 10 years narendra dabolkar govind pansare um mm kalburgi and gauri lankesh now there are also agitations calling for withdrawal of state books etc there are school textbooks hold on and then comes the media's role the media need to know something please stop analyzing media in terms of freedom of expression freedom of speech are babre as many before me have noted there is no problem of freedom of speech in india here i am the problem in india is not here i am talking about mr modi and vishwaguru and everything to all of you the problem in india is not freedom of speech the problem in india is freedom after the speech right that that is our that is our real problem so who knows what happens after this speech i just hope that deepthi and purva and others don't face the consequences of my indiscretions once upon a time the indian press was the wonder of the world in terms of the sheer diversity and multiplicity of voices 
there was a time when anybody with five rupees and a vision could start a newspaper, which is how the Hindu started, for instance. Yeah. Now the media are overwhelmingly corporate owned. You can't think of starting an afternoon paper in Mumbai without an initial outlay of about a hundred crores or more. And you should be able to willing to lose, make losses for five years before you can dream of breaking even. Now, uh, do you know what the size of the Indian media entertainment industry is? It is one industry. It's called Emmy industry. Ernst and Young gave us this figure this March. 2.32 trillion rupees or 28 billion dollars. Now on top of that, in that the biggest owner was Mr. Ambani. Okay. Uh, on two weeks after that report, Mr. Uh, two months after that report, Mr. Ambani struck a deal with Disney Hotstar, which gives one entity more than 50% of the streaming business in India. Hmm. And that entity, that transaction was 8.5 billion dollars. So you're coming to 36.5 billion dollars. Yeah, you're coming to 36.2 billion dollars. That's the size out of which 25% or so, 25% or so, that value belongs to one individual. Where is that diversity? Where was that lovable cacophony of voices in the Indian press that you had? Which, by the way, was so important for you in your freedom struggle. Those many, multiple voices, many voices. But then those papers were run by, those papers were founded and run by Baba Sahib Ambedkar, by Gandhi, yeah, by dyed in the wool believers in freedom. Hmm. Now, um, now look at how the media actually covered some of the biggest events of our time. The farm laws. Do you know that in, the, in two of those three acts, one clause, I, somewhere, either 13 in one and 17 in the other, uses an old colonial thing which Congress kept through, never threw it out. It says, no suit or prosecution shall lie against the, uh, no suit or prosecution shall lie against officers of the central government or officers of the state government. Hmm? And what's more important, you have no right to legal remedy because it bars the jurisdiction of the civil judiciary, of the civil courts. It bars the jurisdiction of the civil courts and tells you you have to only go to a appellate tribunal where such distinguished people as the Naib, Tehsildar and Deputy Collector sit. And they are going to fight Ambani. They are going to fight Adani for you. Talk sense. I mean, be real. Yeah? This is what was put in. Do you, can you uh, tell me one, one major newspaper in this country or one major channel in this country that on its website or its pages gave you the full text of the three farm laws? Go on. Go tonight and look. Look now if you like. So, there was, we did, in the People's Archive of Rural India, which publishes in 15 languages, if you go to our library, you'll find the full text of the laws, and you'll see many, many stories at, linked to those laws on what they meant to farmers. Yeah. Your media never told you that the farm struggle was the largest peaceful, constitutional, democratic struggle for justice in the world, organized at the height of the pandemic. Prior to that, everybody knows about Occupy Wall Street. It was 8,000, 9,000 protesters who were thrown out of park, Zuccotti Park after nine weeks. Your farmers lasted 53 weeks. They survived the worst winter of Delhi in 70 years, the worst summer in 40. They suffered torrential rainfall in the monsoon. 720 farmers died for you and me, not just for themselves, because they were fighting for that right to legally challenge. The right to legal remedy is a very important right in any democracy. The right to legal redress, the right to seek legal remedy. Without that, what do your fundamental rights mean? Nothing. Or you look at 
the journalists and the layoffs. When on the subcommittee looking into the retrenchments, uh, we wrote to the newspapers asking them to tell us how many jobs were lost in this period. And we said, please don't tell us only, tell us about voluntary retirements also because I know how many, I know so many people who volunteered yeah, to be sacked. Hmm. The reply we got from Times of India was, it's none of your business. The press council has nothing to do with this. Press council purview is freedom of expression. This has nothing to do with it. This, this is meant for the law tribunals. It's meant for the labor tribunals. You have no locus standing. An absolutely rude, outrageously rude reply was what we got from this and a couple of other papers. Then, look, if how much your news media are failing you, how many of you can say that we have seen in our media a real figure that the media itself that supports on how many Indians died during the COVID pandemic? How many Indians died during the COVID pandemic? Have you seen anyone challenging the official figure? The Vishwaguru figure is 4,86,000. Less than half a million. Lancet says 4.2 million. Johns Hopkins gives three figures, three lists, all of which are over 4 million. World Development Council says, uh, WHO says 4.7 million. World Development Council DC says 4.9 million. But Vishwaguru says 4.86 lakh, end of discussion. And there are very easy ways of ending discussion. Uh, the, there are very easy ways of ending discussion. What they did, there was one period in the pandemic, if you will recall, when the media as a whole functioned brilliantly, reported relentlessly, and that was when bodies were piling up on the banks of the Ganga, on the banks of the Sarayu, that's when I felt proud to be a journalist again when I saw what was happening. One month and it completely disappeared. How did it disappear? The government, state government and the central government pulled the plug on government advertising. When they pulled, by the way you should see the new laws and how this is being implemented in Kashmir now. When they pulled the plug on government advertising, everybody collapsed. One newspaper group had the spunk to continue fighting and what a price. The, I mean, Dainik Baskar continued. Two weeks after Dainik Baskar continuing to plough its lonely furrow, Dainik Baskar was visited by ED, IT, Economic Offences Wing. There were so many people there, I think that if any of these guys saw another agency going by on the street, they called them to join the party. There were so many people on the necks and back of Dainik Baskar and obviously, Dainik Baskar had to pipe down. Yeah, This was a, a gagging of many kinds that was put in there. So government advertiser, tell me how many of you have a figure that you trust from your media on how many migrant, how many people fled as migrants from the cities back to the villages in COVID? How many of you have a figure from your media that you remember? And that you thought was authentic. You didn't. The numbers were wiped out. The government would not allow it. On, on March 30th, on March 31st, or th March 30th, 20, um, 2020, the Attorney General of India, in an affidavit before the Supreme Court, said there is not a single migrant on the highways now. As of 11.30 a.m. this morning, a month, then 14 days later, the same Attorney General, before the same innocent, naive bench of the Supreme Court, says 23,000 plus relief centers and food feeding centers have been opened for migrants. Now what are you opening those relief camps for if there isn't a single migrant on the road? Maybe for promoting tourism in COVID. Yeah. Then, but one of the great things about large government is that what one department suppresses comes out from another department. In May 26th, the Indian Railways put out a press release. Just the railways 
and the buses connected to it that they had transported in 25 days 91 lakh migrants That's the number of, yeah, you're right. That's the number of tickets sold. Now, those of us who are not activists and who don't understand this, what Ram Kumar is saying, Indians, rural Indians especially, have a very healthy attitude towards public transport. Yeah? Public transport is for the public. Why the hell should I be paying for it? Yeah. So, you know, when, you, when your farmers go from Nashik to Delhi in railways, the common understanding even of the TT and the collector, ticket collector is 200 people, 25 tickets is good. You, you pass them around and everybody has a ticket. I mean, this is how India functions. Okay, this is your country. Know it, love it. It's how it is. I mean, you can, can you imagine 3,000 farmers going from Nashik to this thing, buying 3,000 tickets? Their asset is bankrupt and killing themselves for lack of money. Why do they have to spend that much on railway tickets? So, if the railways say 91 lakh tickets sold, imagine how many people traveled. Okay. So, the, look, today the media is so bankrupt that you are finally getting, um, you are, as I said, the Hindi journalism, cutting edge of Hindi journalism as I see it, is happening on YouTube channels. Many young guys who, when I'm traveling up north, come and talk to me and say, you know, they find me in some other place like Jharkhand and they come and say, I'm, they, he also came for a conference which I came for. I got interviewed by three guys in two days who go back and put it on their little channels. These guys were saying from day one, the BJP will not cross 40 seats in Uttar Pradesh. They said it. Go and see. How many of them said it? Yeah. That, but that diversity is now going to be crushed out. As Incidentally, the Facebook, Google, Twitter have all acknowledged that the largest number of government requests for takedown, blocking and withdrawals has been from India and that they have succumbed to it. The Facebook whistleblower on, in Congress, testimony to Congress, said we did anything that they asked. Okay? So this is where you are as a society. Uh, and remember who is the biggest media owner? Mr. Ambani is the biggest media owner. He is the richest Indian. He is the biggest beneficiary of the farm laws if they come through. And Mr. Ambani doesn't know how many... He can't name all the channels he owns. I could help him there, but I don't think he'd be interested in learning anything from me. And lastly, and I wind up with this thing, is the fifth gagging. All these forms of intimidation, gagging, force, all of these lead finally to that fifth gagging which is self-censorship. Which as I said happens sometimes from you know, expectation of, of self-interest and personal gain, more often from fear and intimidation, very likely from risk of losing a job or landing in jail. So there's state censorship, there is corporate censorship, as I said, Google. Uh, do you know that when Disha Ravi was arrested, Delhi police put out a, uh, Delhi police put out a thank you to Google and Twitter for, on the toolkit stuff. You know? They put out a thank you for cooperation. Mob censorship, as we have seen. Slap censorship. For those of you who don't know what slap censorship is, SLA double P, uh, strategic lawsuit aimed at curbing public participation. My poor friend, Paranjoy Guha Takurta, will tell you he could speak a whole day to you on slap because Adani has slapped him with lawsuits running to over about 100 crores or some thereabouts, but tens of crores in any case. It chills anywhere in the world. This is an American invention, of course, the slap strategy. It chills free speech. You think I'm going to, if I write this, I'm going to get a suit for a hundred, be slapped with a 100 crore notice. Who knows, might still happen with this talk. Uh, all this leads to self-censorship. We gag ourselves. So, Binding with this. What do we do? 
there's plenty to do and this first thing is to recognize that what you and i haven't been doing the ordinary people of this country have been doing the ordinary people of this country showed us something about standing up and rejecting the whittling away of democracy you saw that in your elections the farmers of your country the largest struggle for protest for justice in the world 100000 people gathering at the gates of delhi yeah if there's one thing i've already discussed the farmers so i want but i will say this if there is one thing they taught us they taught us the meaning of the word resistance and it was a peaceful constitutional legitimate protest right all around us the public are giving us that inspiration all around us well in 2019 for me it was one of the great moments of my life when tens of thousands of college students in their teens across the country were standing at the gates and reading the preamble to the constitution i loved it that all those who were ever my students were there though i did tell them you know badhiya hai preamble to bahut badhiya hai lekin you know you might find a few other interesting parts in the constitution as well please read read directive principles of state policy and i think that this is something that's going to become please remember that beating up on the constitution became a very big issue in this election it was a huge issue in this election right so remember this that i think fighting for enforceability of directive principles four or five right to work right to education not the truncated rte with you have but a genuine one a you know the right to food subsumed in the right to life the right to health the right to shelter if these few we can act i am not suggesting something that the courts are dismissing i need you to hear this that the courts the supreme court has given three judgments three judgments of the supreme court the last being by justice ashok ganguly three times in the last 40 years the indian supreme court has ruled that the fundamental that the directive principles of state policy are every inch as important as the fundamental rights the supreme court has said so why should we be keeping quiet on it and not demanding their enforcement yeah it it won't be easy and i think that ultimately it comes down to what by the way dalit and adivasis as i mentioned in the very first gagging have been doing long before us fighting for that one word justice you know it's never been easy it has been done it won't be easy it will be done thank you